Greetings, ladies and managers, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your pleasure. The channel is blazing its way to 100,000 subscribers, so I have a little favor to ask. If you're not subscribed, could you please do so if you enjoy the content? And please don't forget to like. Also, if you could drop a comment down below that says 100k, that would be awesome. It increases engagement and helps promote the video. Anyways, on to the story. Why Can Humans Do Everything? Written by Captain Candy. If you have opened this file, then you, like myself, have begun to wonder why is it that any individual human can do seemingly everything. Normally, races like my own, the spelling have specializations. Engineering, science, medicine, and even in those fields have further specializations. Electrical and mechanical engineers, for example. Every race in the Galactic Council is like this. Every last one, except for the humans. I was finally driven over the edge and felt the need to look at this when I hired a human as a lab assistant. Under their specialization, they had listed only a single word, yes. Confused and admittedly intrigued, I hired David to see what that meant. When I asked him about it, he laughed and said that it was some old human meme from ages long ago. He informed me that he put that there because it was essentially nothing that he wasn't able to pick up or do. Skeptical, I asked him if he could resequence my species genome to have orange skin and purple suction cups. In no more than an hour, he returned to me with a genetic sequence clearly derived from my species with those exact details. At this point, I thought that he must have a degree in genetic engineering, so I assigned him to instead construct a small-scale nanite swarm for waste disposal purposes. Essentially, a high-tech shredder. This time, he didn't come back for about six hours, but he indeed was holding the device that would house the nanites. Baffled, I asked him how he did that in such a time span. His response was something about a 3D printer not allowing the making of some of the parts, so he had to take a few hours to override the safeties. At this point, I listed off a number of tasks that normally would have taken teams of specialists to do, and paid him in advance. Two weeks. It took him two weeks to do what would have taken several teams months. Curious, I asked him about the specifics behind this, and oh boy, did I get an answer that threw me for a loop. Here, I recorded it, have a listen. So David, how is it that you can do all of these things so quickly? Oh, that's easy. I just download apps and tutorials from the Quantranet. You know, the human quantum internet. The... the what? I understand the internet and the quantum, but the two don't mix in my mind. What do you mean? Come on now, seriously, Doc. I know every species that makes it to warp travel has at least some basic instantaneous communication. And I know a solid 60% of species up here have internets on their home planets. Have none of you ever considered, you know... Linking the two together, giving instant access to all the information on your species' internet, anytime, anywhere. I... what? No, only the most basic messages can be sent through unless you scale up the port used for entanglement, but that would cost trillions. We use them for military communications and scientific missions only. Are you telling me that the humans all have 100% access to all the information at all times? Ugh, Doc, now you're going to have to make me tell you a story. All right, get a chair. This one is going to take a while to go over. Okay, so back in the early 21st century, humanity was playing with our quantum understanding of the universe. We finally figured out how to use quantum mechanics to run computers. Hooray, us! Of course, there at first they were basic and were made to do parallel processing of multiple data values simultaneously. Now, while this did increase our understanding of our world and our computing power by a considerable margin, Orders of magnitude, in fact. The ones we made out were crude and simple, to be polite. But looking back at the fact that they functioned at all was pure luck on our part. They were crude things. Now, after a few years, only five or six of the quantum core computers being a thing to the public, some genius came up with an idea and got to work on it. He wanted to make a self-entanglement quantum circuit that could read every value on the same time and essentially lock wave functions to save data at an immaterial level. It was a brilliant idea, really, one he did eventually succeed in doing. But before he got to his primary goal, he did something totally by accident. He realized that if he had two processes that were entangled and a decoder on both of them for inputs and outputs, well, he could in essence link two devices through those chips. At first, big whoop, right? 
Two devices connected. Neat. But then the guy went out camping one weekend and lost cell service completely. But the odd thing was, he still had internet. So the genius looks around and eventually finds out that by linking his home PC with his cell phone, and was giving himself portable access to the internet anywhere at any time. Now this, this was a big ass discovery. He took this information, painted in it, and started his own contranet service. Internet anywhere, anytime. Just use this pair of chips and two devices you want to connect. At this time, we were also working on Neurotech, like brain implanted computers that were at the stage only used for Alzheimer's, dementia, and regulating nerve impulses here and there to stop seizures. Stuff like that, right? Well, once this madman figured out quantum linking, that whole process became something different. The brain chip only needed one adapter chip to connect to a large computer now. Woo! The company at the time who makes these implants contacts the guy and they partner up. In a matter of only a year, the two have it cracked. We can now link our own brains directly to the internet and use our thoughts to control what we do there. Home computers vanish so fast it's crazy. You get the brain implant, it goes into every part of your mind, memory, sensory, etc. Now every sense and ability your brain has is linked to the internet, except for some medical areas that are strictly port only. This made instant full dive VR a thing. We could all close our eyes and tell the computer to switch our visual cortex into data to the computer and play games in virtual reality, just sitting on a damn couch at home. YouTube got big fast when Google jumped on that shit. First person perspective recording through the chips, uploading segments of memories as videos. Now you can go onto YouTube with the chip and literally first person that bitch. Suddenly, you've got a first person experience of pretty much anything you'll want. It's a golden age for learning, entertainment, and oh my god, I don't even want to think about the orders of magnitude of wealth the porn industry grew. So that's it, Doc. Ever since 2062, essentially humans have had the ability to experience anything in first person that they want to. Of course, some safety things cropped up here and there that were corrected, like the cult of Gary, where one guy named Gary's consciousness took over like 2 million people. People refer to it as Vault 108 Mishap, a reference to an old human video game where this one area had a cloning facility of a person named, you guessed it, Gary. Anyways, thanks to all the human sharing memories and experience like it's nothing, and to us, it is. Humanity quickly became a jack of all trades. Hell, I'd say we'd mastered them all too at the same time. Also, no human is ever alone thanks to this. We can chat with each other in our damn heads at any time we want, but we can also turn it off. It's like we are a selective hive mind. It's great, so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, it, uh, uh any other questions? Uh, no, uh, no, th th that's all, David, at least on this subject matter. But on the related note, do you have any friends who would be interested in helping me run this lab? End of story. Story number two. War is War, written by Echoing Cascade. On a late night galactic show, Admiral Armstrong was being interviewed by a host, she who sings no false praises, an Aeon woman. The red-skinned humanoid alien was discussing the current troubles in Sector 421, where the Imorax and the Arturians were on the edge of armed conflict over a resource-rich planet Pariax 4. The host, like most of her species, was vaguely psychic and knew better than to ask where the human military would fall if the two species fought so she was planning to quickly move to the next topic. The other guest, the Silos shuttle racer Armion, on the other hand. So, are you guys stoked about the upcoming war, as we are? Everyone knows humans love war! She who sings no false praise did not need to use her talents to sense that the Silos asking the wrong question. A single look at Admiral Smile was enough for her to feel the room temperature drop by a few degrees. Oh, frack me! This is not gonna end well. The Admiral laughed out loud and patted the man on the back, not too gently. Ha ha ha! Humans love war, huh? The smile he gave the Silas was the kind his ancestor saw but once, and from predators in moonless nights. Would you like to know some fun facts about war? Uh, well, I guess. The most common words of a dying soldier's are, Mother help, I want to go home, mommy save me, I don't want to die. The Silas was at least seven feet tall, yet he could have sworn the Admiral was looming over him like a weight of regret. Funny, right? Uh, 
I don't. Oh, uh, are you familiar with the Geneva Convention? It's one of the reasons we got a fast track into joining the galactic community. Having such civilized rules for war was seen as a great indicator of the type of society we were. Have you read it? Uh, some of it. Every one of those rules exists because those atrocities happened during times of war. Hell, if we ever find an enemy that brings humanity to the brink, it'll become a checklist. The Silos was looking around for the exit. The only thing keeping him in place was the glare from the Admiral pinning him to his chair. You all want to know the stance of humanity on Periax 4 situation. If I think it might become an open wall, I'll bring my dreadnought to the planet, commandeer a relief fleet and evacuate both sides, and then crack that planet to pieces. She who sings no false praise was debating calling security when Admiral Armstrong took a deep breath and regained his calm. Ugh, we don't like war, son. The reason we are so good at it is because we hate it more than anything. We believe that war is hell, and throughout the millennia, we have a seeing nothing to change our minds. So, uh, you won't support the Imarak or the Arturians if the war is declared? She who sings no false praise felt it was high time she asked the question that had been avoiding all night. The Admiral shook his head. Frack, no! We'll declare peace on both of them, whether they like it or not. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomer Waffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Caspar Arnold, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azrakal. Thank you very much.